Hello, this is Chris Nielsen with Breaking Up With Fear. I'm excited to have Joanne Williams here with Anxiety Simplified. So Joanne, would you please introduce yourself to the Breaking Up With Fear audience? Wow. Thanks for having me, Chris. So nice to be here. Um, again, I am Joanne Williams, and I've been a licensed mental health professional for 30 years. And I really feel like at this point, because of all that's going on in the world, I started my own podcast to really get some information out there, get some ways and techniques, simple ways, really simple ways that we can build some skills on what to do around fear. I call it anxiety. I think anxiety, you know, is like the big, maybe the little sister of fear, you know, so, you know, there's a lot we can do. So really, this is more a story of hope and ways that we can move forward. And so I'd like to share some of those ways and skills that I have found. But one of the most concerning things that I have heard of late uh, I'd like to share for kind of launching off here, <laughs> Chris. Um, the CDC put out a warning, and this was actually in June, and I just heard about it. But they put out a warning that 11% of our 18 to 24 year olds and unpaid caregivers were seriously considering suicide right now. 11% is double what it, it usually is. That's and a huge it, number. It's huge. And I, all I can think of, you, you remember, well, most of us went off to college, you know, and we're all excited to go and, you know, have that whole college experience or even the high schoolers to have their prom and get dressed up and have the corsages and the dance and the whole experience. They didn't get to have it this year. It would just not non-existent. You know, they tried to do some things, but it wasn't the same. And I think for college age kids, it's the same thing. They expect this wonderful whatever, and they went off to college. And now they're even shutting down some of the colleges because yeah, they were having that college experience, but at this point it's dangerous. So I think there's a lot of heartbreak and a lot of grief. And then the unpaid caregivers, all I can imagine is like my grandparents, one mm -hmm. sick and yeah. one's taking care of the other one. And now nobody's coming to help anymore. At least a family member would fly in or come help every once in a while. And they're not. Wow. And I don't think they're asking for help. You know, they're the people that are stoic and I can do it. I think they're tired. I think when you say that, a lot of people out there are not asking for help, and I, and I hope I hope they do because I love how you started. You know, hope and some ways to feel better, and so I look forward you, for you That's sharing it. those ways that people can actually Good. feel better right now. Good. One of them that I really want to go to right now is to take everybody take out your phone, and put this number in your phone right now. It's it's one eight hundred number one eight hundred eight. Seven two. Oh, why am I forgetting this? All of a sudden, I've said this a million times. <laughs> Sorry, one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. One eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. And if it's not for you, it's for somebody else that you may be encountering, especially in college. And what is that phone and number for? That phone number, thank you, is a hotline. For to call anytime you're depressed, upset, don't know what to do, you're overwhelmed, don't know who to ask, don't know what to say. And if you just, you know, hit that number maybe and just give it your phone to somebody else to go here. Somebody wants to talk to you right now to help you because people feel kind of helpless on what to do. So yeah. this is something immediate you can do. There's somebody standing by that is a professional and wants to help. And is there a name to this particular hotline or what is this hotline? It's a national depression hotline. Okay. There's some other ones and I'll also send those to you in show notes. There's the uh, mental health 
America hotline. And I'll send that. And there's also an international society that, again, their websites also. And so there's a lot of good information out there that's easy to come across. But that one's really simple. And I have all my clients put that in their phone because usually these moments, they're just your lowest moments. You know, you're just out of options. You don't know what to do sometimes. And you think the worst, I would be better off if you know, and I really so like don't that. want people to go there. Yeah, I really like that. And we will have it in the show notes and to have yeah. that someone you can reach out to. And I'll say this too. If you're wondering if you should reach out, people love to help people. I mean, I love to help people. So let them get an opportunity to meet you, connect sure. with you. And who knows what can happen from there. You could save a life. I yeah. mean, that's really the story. An 18 to 24 year old, come on. You know, I just don't think they have learned how to cope. And all of our coping is getting even more stressed. There's a Washington Post article in June that called this a shadow pandemic, a mental health shadow pandemic that actually right now, anxiety and depression are up to 33 to 50 percent of the really? population. Wow. Yes. I mean, this is a mental health crisis. You don't hear a lot about it, unfortunately. You know, and I think that's really unfortunate because we don't know what to say. Oh, what do I do? And what I would say is, listen, you really don't have to do much. Listen to what this person is saying or ask them, you know, a simple question, not how are you or even what can I do? Can Because they, they, they're, they're shut down. Their brain is like, I, I don't know what to do. But maybe you could say, like, you're really looking stressed. You know, there's counseling services on campus. If you go to the medical, I'll go with you or I'll call them. But if you can just kind of move them a little bit in a direction with some good questions, that they can say yes or no to, then they go, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, sure. And I think you said this too, um, or uh, you pointed me towards it. I think sometimes we want to help the people we love, but they can't take it from us sometimes. And if we refer them to a great resource of someone who can listen really well to them, that's trained what a difference that can make. Absolutely. And there is people standing by. And now we're doing therapy like this, which I, I, to me, it, it, you don't have to drive anywhere. You don't have to spend money on gas, parking, going in waiting rooms. It's just such an easier medium to find counseling. So, you know, reach out. I'd love to tell a story. Um, yeah, please. I have... I have, um, I can't even remember where I got this and it just broke my heart. There's a story that a man was walking to jump off a bridge mm. to kill himself. If somebody didn't look him in the eye and smile, that's all I ask. Look me in the eye and smile. Nobody did. And they found out about this because of the suicide note. And that's what it said. If nobody looks at me and smiles, there's no reason to live. Mm -hmm. And to this day, that just shakes me to my core that you mean a little smile, an S-M-I-L-E, is one of the simplest techniques ever <laughs> that you could do to save a life. Look in somebody's eyes and say, and I, li I like to do, even in the grocery store, I practice this. I mean, look at somebody's smile and send a thought, an intention to them. I care about you. You don't have to say it, just send it. And I swear people respond. Babies do. Babies always do. Our little <laughs> kids. Notice, do? Okay. The, you'll notice their eyes. They'll follow me. They get it. And so it's kind of a vibrational thing that you were just sending. And it works beautifully. I so love it. things we can do. And I, I bet you feel good when you do it. <laughs> you know, isn't that why we do everything? Yeah. <laughs> it Look. makes us feel better. Right. And to, again, I was talking earlier, to give a gift to someone. So a gift, simple gift for someone can be your simple smile and acknowledgement that they're alive, that they've been seen, that they matter. 
They do. Thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful, simple, and we all can do that. That's what my mission is. If I, if I want to call it a mission, simplified solutions. And I said to anxiety because anxiety is the uh, largest mental health disorder. And that 33 to 50% right now of our population, I mean, most people, and I have a feeling right now it may be higher than that, um, that people are just not knowing what to do. I think there's a factor, especially with people that have had some unfortunate traumas or things happen in their life. This is just another compounding factor that they just shut down or they freeze or they don't know what to do. And that's what I want to offer simple things. This does not have to be, uh, I have to discover all this stuff or whatever, but you have to practice them. These are skills, simple skills, but practicing will bring these to your forefront quickly, you know, because you don't have to think so hard. And you've been in this field for uh, a long time, you said, as we came into this. Why don't you give a little bit of your background there and then maybe share a few of these, these uh, simple skills that we can learn. Yeah, love to. I got into um, counseling after having alcoholic father, narcissistic mother, yes, mother, and not really feeling like there was anybody to turn to in my family. I always felt like the round peg and the trying to put it in the square hole it just didn't fit in. So I feel like I did things the hard way every step of the way, but I was bound. I wasn't going to do it the way my family did it. I mm -hmm. knew there was a better way. So I got counseling when I was, well, I was, I was divorcing my first alcoholic husband, my only first. Um, and in, I had two children at that point. I'm like, they're not going to be learning. They're going to learn something else. So I had a fabulous counselor that changed my life, Ken Cardillo, Portland, Maine. And I saw ways out. I saw these were skills. You have to use them in practice. But once I did, and then I became and went back to school. My kids were teenagers. I went back to school, finished my undergrad, went to graduate school, and I've been doing it ever since and absolutely loving it. Worked in all kinds of realms and private practice the whole time, but always having like in hospitals or schools or other ways also. But I feel like I have done this long enough to condense down ways to help and really chunks of concise ways to do that. And that's what I put up on my site, anxietysimplified.net. And even to a, a workbook that anybody can get there free. It's, it's called The Act. And I don't know if you can see that, but it's yeah. The Act workbook. It's ACT for really growing your awareness. You got to know, again, what's going on up there with your thoughts, with your intention. About so how life. do you grow your awareness? All right. Again, you got to notice what am I thinking mm -hmm. right now about the situation? And let's say I'm in college and now I have to even go home because they've shut down or I got kicked out because I went to the party. If you can even just kind of imagine what they might be thinking, I'm a failure, I'm stupid, I can't do anything right. So those kinds of thoughts, again, will create a feeling of insecurity, un being unloved. And so once you can start to be aware of what you're thinking and you decide, it's a choice, to change that thought, wow, yeah, I made a mistake, but that doesn't mean it's the end of the world. And I think a lot of kids, because they're more in the emotional part of our brain, the lower part of our brain, they just go into that emotional place of, hating or, or whatever kind of emotion that they kind of have a habit of. So it's really about checking in, looking at what am I thinking right now? Is this going to get me to my goal? If it's happiness, joy, getting my degree, is that kind of defeatist thought going to get me there? No. So no, what I, do I, I need to be thinking? Yeah. 
I love that you bring that awareness to our thoughts. And yes, our thoughts, we can, and you said this too, you can decide to change your thoughts. It's a lot of what I teach in some with innovative leaders and teams is it's a choice. And, and even people in their 50s, 60s, 70s didn't realize they have a choice to think something. They're thinking this, they can think something different. Options, options, options. You know, we can choose. We can choose lots of things. And suicide can be one option, but I'm telling you, there's a list of 45 before that. When we think about, I can change this mindset to focus on what, and you know, this is the biggest thing I, I see with clients as I work with them with this ACT method, is they think about what they don't want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so what, no, what do you want? Oh, you know, it's like, I didn't think of that, but how can you get, let's say to Boston, if you don't chart it out you yeah. yeah i just want to go but that you may be going south instead of north so to me it really is you've got to be able to know where you want to go yeah that's a great example so what what else would you share with the group so simple techniques if let's say they're feeling really bad in this moment what's something they could do to maybe change that course of that action ah uh, uh, i love it you know if it, you know we've given the one about the smile i love that one you know just i do too even for changing your own attitude this is one i love it's a little goofy i think i got it from tony robbins though i mean 25 years ago a lot of this stuff you know it's look up and open your arms up and smile Nobody has to see you. And, you know, that's the part people are like, well, you know, you don't. It's such a simple thing. You, when you practice this, you can't but help a giggle. It can change your mood really, it can. really quickly. I say just do it even right now. Just do look it. up, oh, expand your chest. It feels so good. It does feel good. And just, I mean, as big as you can do this smile, you can't help but giggle, right? <laughs> 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 I think the other one we ignore and that we all know about, but I think somehow our breathing gets neglected, especially in fear. We'll notice this, you know, this almost panting kind of a breath. And if anybody's taken yoga, highly recommend it because it will teach you belly breathing when it's just breathing through your nose, let your belly rise and breathe out through your mouth. It is our most calming, natural way to calm. Breathe in through your nose and out. And some I think some people can tell I'm upset with them when I go. <laughs> <laughs> You're refocusing. <laughs> but you know what? If somebody's no, it, aware it that. Works. Yeah. It does. If they're aware and looking at you, they're going to go, oh. Oh, okay. Oh, reset. No, but it know? is. It also resetting my body too, because you're right. When when we're in that fear breathing, it's high in the chest. It's very short. You're not <laughs> getting the the blood. Actually, breathe like you're fearless is one of the things I say. Breathe like you're ah. fearless. And when you do that, the body's saying you're not in fear right now. There's nothing yeah. to fear. Yeah. You know, I'd like to even continue with that line of thinking about how our body takes over. Yeah. Because I think sometimes we forget that our bodies are, and, and, part, and our mind is to keep us alive and survive. I mean, we are survivors. We've been through a lot through history. And it's because our bodies will do that. It's the fight, flight, or freeze. You know, it will yeah. just... I. I don't know what to do, but it gives you a little bit of time to kind of think through something. But we do have a part of our brain, the amygdala, and our emotional brain that was developed at six months. And then our, our really higher part of our brain doesn't even start to develop till we're 12 and to 35, 25 to 35. It's still developing our cognitive ability to think through, understand, look at situations, 
analyze them. Where this lower part, this emotional part, it's just reacting, right? It's just going, going, going with emotions. And that's what happens with fear. That fear, if, and especially if anybody's had a trauma, even bullying, you know, any kind of thing that made that reaction of stark fear, I might not survive. It, our bodies, our minds kicks in to that reaction to survive. And when mm-hmm. it does that, you're, you, it's like you really can't control it a lot of times. That's what happens with people with post-traumatic stress disorder or panic. Panic with disorder would probably even be a better example of that. People's breathing will get quick, you know, and it is all to help you pull blood in your uh, heart to get ready to run. So it's there to help us survive. You know, truly feel fear is a, a, a purpose to keep us alive. And if we can understand it, then our fear isn't trying to do something bad to us in lots of ways. It's really to help you get prepared. If that, and it's really about the the tiger coming at us, you know, that that's when it's like we had to do something and be ready, but that's not what's happening now, but we're having similar responses in this overwhelming kind of responses. And actually, one of the articles that, or actually it was a, a seminar I went to, they're talking about right now, we can have what's called a secondary traumatic stress response because of COVID, because of this overwhelming and continual stress. That's what's creating some of these you know, what we call, you know, the increased stress responses and fear is certainly, or panic, anxiety, depression is one of them because it's putting us into that survival type mode and we're reacting instead of using this part of our brain that was developed later, but to reassure ourselves, you're going to be okay. When your brain hears that, it can tell that lower part, you're going to survive. You're all right. Breathe. <laughs> so are you Let's saying through this? Are you saying the self-talk then to yourself? You're you're gonna be okay. Just breathe. You're gonna get through this. You know, it's what our moms did or dads did when we were little, right? And we're crying, like, I don't know what to do. I'm a little kid at two years old or whatever. And they would sit and rock us, right? Or pet us, or you know, kind of make mm-hmm. soothe us. We need to learn to do that for ourselves. And how do we do that? Many people, people will rock. You know, they'll just sit there. If you ever see anybody rocking, that's what they're doing. They're self-soothing. And a lot of times we don't get that from outside anymore. You know, we're not a little kid anymore. And a lot of people don't say, it's going to be all right. We hope I think we need someone. Partner- oh, we need God. someone around that would self-soothe us. <laughs> that's really relaxed and calm themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Or even somebody being calm around us. You know, we see that, okay, they're not freaking out. (laughs) I'll be okay. But yeah, it's like we have to learn some skills and um, there is a ton of them. One I'd like to share too, another really simple one right now is rituals. Rituals were developed, again, who knows how long ago, but again, to do the same thing over and over again, that really kind of just helps us know everything is okay. I recommend even using like the same coffee cup every day, your favorite one that you know you love, the way it feels in your hand and you can drink out of it, a, a nice soothing, warm, whatever. Do that, you know, things that make you feel good, like in the morning, what makes you feel feel relaxed, breakfast with your family or not, you know, whether it is comfort foods right now, we're all gaining weight is because we're trying to self soothe ourselves. Yeah, and, and I would say to that, you know, one of my things that keeps me very sane is exercise. So I'm not gaining weight is if X, I think exercise is one of the best thing you can do because we were meant to move. We were meant to uh, get rid of something of that anxiety by actually moving. So I think that's so powerful. 
I agree. And even if it's up and down the stairs in your house or in your facility or walking the dog, um, you know, whatever it is that you can do, just get off the couch, walk around. They say really every hour, if you're sitting down, you really need to just get up, do a little bit. It doesn't have to be, you know, strenuous or a lot. Just do something. I agree. Yeah. So is there a fear that you have broken up with um, that you'd like to tell that story? (laughs) It's like, oh boy, how many has there been? You know, and I I don't even know where I get these things from, but I I have a tenacity and I, I think it's more about some of the inner strengths that you possess that you may not even know where they came from or why you have them. But I just remember when I decided to become a a counselor, a licensed counselor. So I had to go back and I was 30 something when I decided to go back to graduate school, right? Well, and, and I want people to hear that too. You talk about the kids in school stressing out, am I going to graduate and all this other stress. Yeah. There's no yeah. perfect timetable for any of this. And it, the more you make reality bad, the, the less you're going to enjoy it. it. I loved your story that with two teenage, two teenagers, was that right? Two teenagers, yes. And but, one that was going into high school and wanted to go back and live with his father. Okay. Who was alcoholic lived in a place where you could have total freedom, no rules, drive cars if you want, drive boats if you want, drink if, I mean, just like a kid's dream, right? Mm -hmm. Some kids, (laughs) some kids, yeah. (laughs) Some kids, thank you. Um, But it was really a horrible time in my life. And I just was like, I'm doing it. And it was more, again, my mindset, I am doing this no matter what. And I think that's what helped me get through. And fear, it it was more like barriers and I'll call, you know, they can be fear, but there was a lot of different types of barriers that had to be broken to do it. And I think it was more my mindset. I'm doing this. I want to do this. I have like a drive. And I think that's really a key. When somebody has like, something like they know for sure that they have to do it puts you kind of in what i would call like the zone like if you play sports when you get into that space that you can't do anything wrong almost you know no matter what you do you get the basket or you hit the ball whatever it is but i felt like that it was one of those times and it was probably and i and i had to drive two hours from a city into boston and I, I hate driving in, in big cities and traffic. I do and, too. That, that oh. two hour drive might have, I, I could get through a lot of obstacles. That two hour drive might have been the one that stopped me. I know. And, and Boston traffic, which I don't know if you know Boston at all, but it's a little New York City. It's like all condensed and there's lots of one way streets and cobblestones and little tiny streets you know, big, big interstates too, but that's what I would have to go through. And, you know, in a winter, and I was actually in Maine then and drive to Boston. And (laughs) that in itself was so paralyzing that again, I tried to figure out some ways to get around driving. And that's what it was. I had to look for options. I had to look for ways. I had to look for support to be able to figure this out. Nobody was going to hand me this. You know, nobody was going to just do it for me. And I was 35. And I remember even the kids in the class, you know, they're they're in their 20s. And they looked at me as old, right? I'm 32 or something. It's like, what? (laughs) I didn't even let that bother me because it was, again, I'm doing this no matter what. And I think tenacity, if you can find that within yourself, something that drives you so much. And you know, it's kind of like this podcast (laughs) to come to think of it. I feel like there's been so many, just technical things. You know, it's like so many little obstacles, but when you break them down, and one of the things in my act, method, I'd call it step by step. And I feel like I use that a lot. 
So tell, tell us a little more about that. This is one of my things that I really did develop as, a, as one of the counseling techniques that I use. If you don't know what your goal is, even if it's calmness, how are you going to get there? Right. So that's the first step of the A is awareness. What do you want? Mm-hmm. Again, like I said, not what you don't want. What do you want? And it's got to be that you want it bad enough. The desire is so strong that you will do whatever it is and just believe you can. So there's really two facets to that awareness that you got to believe. And that's a whole nother subject. But getting to that belief can be some of the hardest in steps you know, is I can believe I can do. Yeah. When you have that knowingness and that drive to do it, you'll have the belief. And that's where support comes in sometimes because you do sometimes need a little bit more. (laughs) Somebody, the cheerleader in your life. Yes, you can. I will be there. I will, you know, reassure you. I'll take care of the kids or I'll cook a dinner. You need some support sometimes so that you can look within. This is not easy to do. It's simple. I'll give you that. It can be really simple to follow these steps but it's looking inside. And most people refuse to do that, you know, in so many different ways until they have to. And I would really encourage people, it's not that scary. When you start to do that, especially with support and help, it's not that bad. They imagine the fear is bigger than they've imagined it to be. Absolutely. I, I like to use the analogy of the boogeyman. I I think most of us can remember, you know, when we're like five or six and that boogeyman's underneath the bed and I know he's going to get me if I put my feet on the floor. I I don't think I'm the only one. (laughs) No, I I talk about it a lot. (laughs) I actually say like the monster under your bed. The monster. And, you know, once you put your feet on the floor or you look into that monster's eyes or the boogeyman, I call him, it becomes like a little dust bunny, you know, and it just goes, you know, and it just, you can blow it away, but it is the imagination that we have. We have really powerful imagination. You can use it to either direction to make that monster huge. And I'd say it, dust bunny. Yeah, I would say great, great example. Turn your monster into a dust bunny. And I'd say this too. If you have an imagination like me, do not watch scary movies. <laughs> I, can't. I can't. Exactly. I will have, I will remember this a scene forever. Yeah. yeah, and, so, yeah. I, I love that. And uh, just to add on to what you said earlier too, is, is what pulled you to drive two hours in traffic with two teenagers was this, you had this big goal, you were committed, you were persistent. And what I say too, is if you can find a big why, a reason for doing something that can pull you through the fears. Then if you're aware in that process, you realize, oh my gosh, they were not that big. They were not that dangerous. You know, and especially when you make them into chunks or steps, you know, I just got to do this right now. And it will lead you to the next step. Instead of looking at this whole chain of, oh my gosh, I got to do this, 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 and this, and this. That's what's overwhelming sometimes and will shut us down. But if you just look at, I just have to get this one thing done right now, that's enough. And it's, 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 it's actually a depression um, therapy or you call it chunking things down into Mm -hmm. manageable pieces. And it really helps our brain. If you can just think one thing today, if I just do one thing and you know, we have a to-do list and even just looking at that sometimes is like, oh my gosh, that is overwhelming. And if you can just put the paper up to one thing, (laughs) I'm only going to get this (laughs) one thing done today. What I've experienced, you might do three anyways yeah. yeah i love that and uh as we i mean here's as we wrap up i want to one of my favorite things is your smile talking about mm. that is that uh 
And I know in this time, oftentimes we're not as much in public, so we can't directly smile at someone, but you can smile when you're on the phone with someone and you can give them Absolutely. that. Absolutely. You can be smiling and sending that positive feeling to someone over the phone and give that gift. I know when I was feeling really miserable at certain things, I could still help people and it actually made me feel yeah. good. So if there's someone you can give to yeah. help to smile, say that you matter to me, you care about, I love that. So Anything else you'd like to add? Any I other would. little simple was, tip? And then there we'll wrap is it up. one thing I really want to share about. I do certifications for people to have an emotional support animal. Mm. And that has become one of the simplest ways I have ever seen to help people with fear or anxiety is to get an animal that helps them, like maybe to fly. They are so afraid to get on a plane because they, again, they've imagined these things. They can have their animal with them to fly or be in no pet housing so that they might socialize better, helps them sleep better. One study really showed even just petting your animal, even if they're not an ESA, an emotional support animal, but 10 minutes of interactions with an animal, cat, dog, produces a reduction in cortisol, you know, that stress hormone. Mm -hmm. So there, an immune response, there has been so many great studies how our animals help us. If you've got an animal... <laughs> pet them. You know, if you've got an animal, take them over to your mom and dad's. If they, again, if they're stressed or in that caregiver, it is amazing. Alzheimer's patients to see them with an animal. You can just see them feel better. And I, I, lo I love it because my mom and dad, our, our dog is Sophie. I'm in my childhood home, actually in Northern Minnesota now with them. Ah. And um, Sophie, she is an amazing calmer. <laughs> they and, are. Both my parents just love her so dearly. It's uh, what a difference you know, she even, makes. Even 15 airports have handlers that walk dogs around it because they know it calms the entire atmosphere or mm. environment. Wow. And you know, even one of the best things from COVID, the shelters are empty. Yeah. Yeah. That shows how animals in your life can actually help you in numerous ways. I, I totally agree there. Um, how can people reach you, Joanne? Thank you for sharing such wonderful stuff. I, I love your mission of bringing anxiety down in this world and helping those people that are suffering out there. Please reach out because people do care. They do want to help and that's a gift to help others. So how can they, they reach you, Joanne? All right, great. Uh, uh, Anxietysimplified.net. Okay. And I've got, you can... I'll give, there's a, a free, the ACT, ACT method that I was talking about. You can have free there. You can download it. I also offer a free 10-minute consultation that you can reach me through the website. Again, anxietysimplify.net. I can give direction. I can give recommendations. You know, people sometimes don't even know on the back of their insurance card, there's an 800 number for their mental health providers that they can reach out to. And most people right now are doing therapy through a computer. Yep. You don't have to go any place. So there are so many services, you know, just having that 1-800-273-8255 number in your phone to help somebody. Because we've said this, I am really, my intention is we're going to save a life today. Because yeah, somebody thank you for that wonderful that intention. And gives it to somebody in college or at anywhere, but really reach out anytime we're here to help. If you want an emotional support animal, same thing. They can help you in, in numerous, in numerous ways. I, I love your intention. And I also, I think someone may be watching this just in, that they'll feel better and feel hope because of that, your story. And I've been through a lot of fears myself. Um, please reach out and help someone else or let people help you because you are letting them letting them fulfill their purpose in life and take Joanne up on her 10, 10 minutes. I'm sure she can calm you down, make you feel better, give you hope in life if you reach out and do that. So thank you so much, you. Joanne, for being here. Hopefully we help some people move towards breaking up with some Absolutely. of their fears. And uh, I love Absolutely. the mission that you're on. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much for having us. Life is too precious to let it go. Life is too precious. Yes.